Hello, everybody, and welcome in to my latest live broadcast. Today is Tuesday, the 26th of May, 2020. I was chuckling because that's the old classic intro. I thought it's been a while since I played it, and it just makes me smile. And today uh, is a follow-up on a video I did earlier this week about removing the bloatware or the programs I uninstall from Windows 10 before I deliver it to a customer. It's, I had, I had mentioned in an earlier broadcast uh, the amount of time I spend getting Windows installed, activated, configured, which includes optimizing and uh, removing unwanted apps. And there are some apps you simply can't remove through the Windows built-in utilities. Now, before I get too much further, I had some uh, it, audio issues a, a little earlier today. I was doing an interview with uh, Harry Brelsford, does a Tech Tuesday over at uh, Northwest Digital Tech. And uh, they had mentioned there was some really bad audio before we started broadcasting, and I have no idea what that was all about. So hopefully my audio is crystal clear. I hope, I hope, I hope. And uh, I'll wait for some feedback from the chat room before I get into this. There's a couple of things I want to get done today. Well, I still have some daylight left in the day. And we'll get with that here in just a moment. Everybody's saying hello. Hey, everybody. Hello right back to you. Sharon says, don't forget to talk about UK people sending you gift cards. Sharon sent me an Amazon gift card earlier today from Amazon.co.uk. And while I appreciate the gesture, I have to spend the money at Amazon.co.uk. And uh, this happened before. Uh, Peter Laycock also had sent me a gift card a few months ago uh, using Amazon.co.uk. And I thought I could just easily transfer that to my Amazon.com account because when I log into Amazon.co.uk, it appears to accept my login from Amazon.com. So it's very confusing. And when I wrote to Amazon and I said, look, this money doesn't do me any good if I have to order from Amazon.co.uk because some of the prices in the UK are higher and the shipping will take forever. And one of the things everybody loves about Amazon is the fast shipping. And they said, that's okay, you can, still, you can still order from us, we'll ship to you. So, no, you're not listening to me. I don't, I don't want to order from Amazon.co.uk. I don't want to wait six weeks for the product to arrive, and I don't want to pay more for it than I would pay for the same product here in the States. I just want that money moved to my Amazon.com account. Well, I think there's some money laundering laws or something that prevent Amazon from doing it. I, I don't think it's a random company policy. As a result, I've asked uh, the folks who've been kind enough to send me those cards to ask Amazon for a refund because I can't use uh, British pounds here in the United States, and I would have to buy from Amazon.co.uk. And you know, even if the price were the equivalent, I would still wait four to six weeks for delivery, which you know is ridiculous. So sending an Amazon gift card, I, I had a gentleman from India also send me a, a gift card from Amazon.co. I don't know, maybe it's Amazon.in, whatever it is in India. And it forces you to use the money there and then have the item exported out of the country, which is preposterous. So even though Amazon uh, shares the name and it's the same company, it operates as individual companies uh, that are not interconnected financially in that way. You need a, apparently a separate account for each version of Amazon. You know, there's a version for France and a version for Germany and a version for England and a version for India and a version, of course, for the United States. So while I appreciate the gift cards, if you're in another country, you've got to purchase the gift card from Amazon.com for me to be able to use it. So thank you for reminding me of that, Sharon. Frankie B sent a $100 Amazon gift card earlier today. Thank you to Frankie B for your support. I appreciate that very much, of course. And um, <laughs> Glenn says, my audio is fine, but my face needs a lift. 
Yeah, well, you know, fighting gravity for 50 plus years, it'll, it'll start to weigh you down a bit after a time. Now, uh, it sounds like the audio is going out okay. Greg says you cannot get your refunds on gift cards. Au contraire, Greg. In fact, you can get refunds on gift cards because Sharon will tell you herself she got a refund on that gift card. And Peter Laycock will tell you he got a refund on his gift card too. So now I can't take the gift card and get a refund, but the person who buys the gift card, if it's not used, if you purchase the gift card with the intent to give it to somebody and for whatever reason cannot give it to them and it's unused, uh, certainly Amazon will deactivate that gift card and return the money to the purchaser. I know that is a fact because, well, just ask Sharon. She did it earlier today. That's a, perhaps an exception. I understand normally gift cards are gift cards, and it is what it is. But in this particular instance, Amazon is doing the right thing since the gift card, there's, there's no way for me to activate it. So I can't use it. Certainly, Sharon or Peter could find somebody else to give it to or use it themselves, I suppose. But the right thing for Amazon to do is to realize this is not a scam. Uh, the activation numbers, uh, the, the card number, was never activated and therefore uh, just return the money as it were. And so they did. That's factual. And Sharon will confirm that. John says you can log into Amazon.com from the UK and it will allow you to buy a gift card with no problem and it's dead easy. Yeah, exactly my point. As easy as it is to buy the gift card from Amazon.co.uk, if you're in the UK, you just simply would use Amazon.com and go through the same process. And you'll be paying in, it'll be a, in dollars instead of in pounds. So I, I, I'm not exactly sure how that conversion takes place exactly. Uh, Sharon just went through it earlier today. Perhaps she can explain it. But uh, uh, Sharon's there in the chat room confirming she got her refund. And it was great because Sharon sent a small amount to test it. Uh, Peter did not. Peter sent a large amount. So I was really broken hearted to have to tell Peter, you know, I can't refund this on your behalf. You have to reach out to Amazon customer service. You have to explain this to them and they will refund your money. Initially, Amazon said to me, we'll take care of it for you. And then it didn't happen. And I said, look, you know, you said you would take care of this. And I've just emailed the gentleman. And he says he's not getting his refund. And they said, well, he's got to contact us directly. I said, well, that's not what you said before, and why are you contradicting yourself? Are you just making this up as you go? Is there a training issue? Is there somebody there who actually can tell me for certain what the process is? Because this is a lot of money, and it's sitting in limbo because the person who gave it to me can't use it, and I can't use it. And we're simply asking you to return it back to the person. And they said, yeah, we apologize for the confusion. The customer service representative made a mistake. And it had to do with, um, I don't know if it was, uh, there was a really good reason for it, and I can't remember. I want to say it was fraud protection. It's not fraud, because it wouldn't be fraud to return somebody's money to them. It was some kind of, um, I think, European Privacy Act, where they can't do something on a user's behalf without the user specifically requesting it. Anyway, it made sense, but I was just upset that I wasn't told that the first time. So, uh, so yeah, so Sharon sent a small amount, and then you know, I explained to her that that won't work, because so I had to explain to the, the gentleman in, in India. I, and again, it's a very nice, thoughtful gesture, and I appreciate it very much. Unfortunately, in your country's currency, uh, I have to buy from your country, uh, essentially is what it works out to. And I do believe it has to do with money laundering laws, right? It'd be kind of a shifty way to move money if you could somehow convert another country's currency through gift cards. Uh, I, I, could, I could totally see where a criminal organization could benefit by hiding money that way. So, you know, it, it all makes sense. I just, you know, thanks to the criminals, I guess, right? 
Scott Brooks has contributed 10 bucks. He says, I just want to say thanks for sharing. Remus Computer had a great time working on my new computer. Hey, thank you, Scott. Thanks for the contribution. Had another issue I did not catch on, um, on the way Anthony builds systems. When I spoke to Anthony about building the computer that's right here behind me, this is this was supposed to ship today to, to Mahdi, but it's going to go out tomorrow because a sharp-eyed viewer noticed when I was doing close-ups of the computer and the wiring that the hard drive LED was not hooked up. It was wire tied up on the back side, and I hadn't noticed it. And I know some cases today don't come with hard drive LEDs, and I had mentioned it when I was looking over the computer that it seemed to me that there was no power or hard drive LED. And then when I turned the machine on, I saw this blue light right here in the corner light up. And I said, oh, maybe you know it has a hard drive LED too. And then I forgot to go back and look. And then um, whoever it was, and I apologize for not giving you credit, remembering what your name is, they said, why is the hard drive LED wire tied? Why isn't it hooked up? And I thought, hmm, are they seeing something I'm not seeing? And so I turned the computer and I looked back here, and right in this bundle, if we go back and look at the original video, the hard drive LED is tied up. Well, that's weird. Now, I promised Mahdi that if he would entertain and humor me to allow me to let Anthony build his system, that I would inspect it to make sure it meets my requirements but I am very curious how Anthony builds. So when I spoke to Anthony, Anthony said, he asked me, is there anything you want me to do special? Do you want to do this? Do you want to do that? I said, stop. I said, I want you to build the computer the way you normally build computers for your clients. Don't do anything special for me. Always do it the same way. And then let me review your work. And that way we can see what you and I do differently because we share a lot in common. He's very passionate and very detail-oriented. I mean, if you look, I just want to give you an example of the, the madness of, of Anthony Remus, of the detail. It's crazy. You see these zip ties Anthony's using? Where are they? Over here? Notice they all face the same direction. And no matter where I point the camera at those gray zip ties, they all face the same direction. Now you'll see I had to replace Anthony's gray zip ties with black ones because I don't have any gray ones. And the reason Anthony went with the gray, which again I didn't notice on the initial review of this computer, this is how detailed Anthony is. Like you really have to have a sharp eye to see what Anthony's doing. If you notice these gray fans. So these fans, if I raise the camera you can actually see the fans. This rear case fan and this front fan, these two front fans, these are Noctua Redux uh, OEM fans. They're intended for system builders. They're not the retail Noctua fans, so they're less money. And the way Noctua uh, identifies certain types of brands of their product is through color. So you've got, for example, the Chrome, what is it, Chromax or something? Those are the black Noctuas. You've got the uh, Redux, which are these gray Noctuas that sell for quite a bit less. And I, I talked to Anthony a bit about that. I said, uh, didn't the case come with fans? He goes, yeah, but they're not as good. Okay, I mean, I didn't ask you to change the fans. He goes, no, but you told me to do things the way I would normally do them. This is what I would normally do. Okay, fair, that's fair. I just feel like, weren't the fans that came with the case black? Yeah. So why are these gray? Well, I kind of go with a black and gray theme. I'm like, well, there's nothing gray but the fans. But then I notice the zip ties are gray. So you win. You got me. All right. So anyway, I thought it was unnecessary. I think the fans that come with the case are fine. <clears throat> now, Anthony's a great guy. I really like Anthony. And I really respect the quality of the work that he does and his passion and the time that he puts in it. However... I think he's working too hard. <laughs> okay. So Anthony does things a little differently than me, and this is the only way I was going to know was to just have Anthony build the way he normally builds and let me review. So a couple of things Anthony does differently. Anthony removes the covers 
over the M.2 sockets because when supporting customers that are several states away, several hundred or thousand miles away, Anthony has to explain to the customer where the drive is. And if it's hidden behind that cover, it makes his job much more difficult. So he leaves the covers off so the clients can clearly see where their M.2 drives are. And he's done the testing with the covers on and with the covers off. And it doesn't make much of a difference in cooling at all, which of course is true. It's an aesthetic, all right? It's just there for looks. So he leaves it off. But the good thing is, is he includes it in the box with the parts in case you want to put them back on. But something Anthony did that I did not know was this motherboard originally had a plastic cover over the I.O. Wait, right in the back, you can't see. And he removes that. He thinks it's gaudy and unnecessary. But he does not include it in the box with the rest of the parts, which I don't understand why. So again, I <laughs> back on the phone with Anthony. I'm like, Anthony, what are you selling those on eBay? Why wouldn't you give that to the customer? Like, why are you holding on to these parts? So from what I can tell, Anthony's got a couple of extra fans from the case. He's got the IO cover. He has no use for it. There's no use for it. Why not just give that stuff to your customer? Well, and this is an important thing to notice. Anthony has a different kind of customer than I have. All right? And nothing Anthony is doing is wrong. Because if it was... <laughs> Anthony's been in business since 2015. So granted, he's not been in business as long as me, but he's got a different kind of customer than me. And his customer is very knowledgeable and very specific about what they want. And so their customers are, his customers are also uh, more uh, affluent. They want overclocked systems. They want warranties on those overclocked systems. And they want a certain level of build quality and speed, not just speed of the computer, but speed of getting it done and delivered. And I don't do that. Like, I wouldn't deal. Those customers are a pain in my butt. On the other hand, you know, Anthony can make over 10 times what I make on a computer build. But Anthony's also putting in 10 times more work and extending the warranty, which he's responsible for, meaning he's got to keep spare parts on hand at his cost. Because if a part goes and the manufacturer doesn't make it anymore, well, Anthony is still covering it under his warranty. He needs a solution right away for his customer. Even if the motherboard, let's say, goes bad, and even if the motherboard has a three-year warranty from the manufacturer, Anthony doesn't have the convenience of getting the board back, shipping it off to the motherboard manufacturer, waiting for a return, and having the customer wait you know, three weeks for their system to come back. Right? If the, it would be four weeks, if you think about it. If, if the customer's on the East Coast, it's going to take you know, a couple of days to arrive in the mail. Then Anthony's got to diagnose it. He's got to fill out the forms online for the motherboard manufacturer to get an RMA number. He's got to box that up, take it to the shipping place, ship it off at his expense. Then he's got to wait for the motherboard manufacturer to return the product to him, install it, reconfigure it, because Anthony does all this custom bias work for the overclocking. He's got to put all that back. And of course, he's got to take everything off the, the original board and put it all back again. It's a big job. Box it back up, and it's another few days back in the mail back to the customer. Anthony's customers, when they're paying that kind of money and they're that demanding, they're not going to wait a month for their system to be repaired. So Anthony has spare motherboards at his expense that he can swap out instantly, and then he'll deal with the RMA on his own and then, you know, presumably take the return board and put it back on the shelf as another spare. I imagine that's how it works. I haven't gone that in-depth with Anthony on it. So I, I emailed Anthony today and I said, so what's the deal with the hard drive LED? I understand why you remove the heat shields off of the motherboard for the M.2 drives. I get it. I understand why you removed the I.O. cover. I don't get why you didn't include it, but I get why you removed it. But here's one thing I don't understand. You didn't hook up the hard drive LED, and the hard drive LED is crucial for me, me, an old school tech, because it's one way I can tell if a system is frozen or is it busy working on a task in the background by seeing if that light is blinking or solid. So Anthony said, you know, he had a computer on his desk and he found that the solid state drives are so fast, the light was just constantly flashing and distracting him and he disconnected it. And so he didn't say any customers said that. He said he felt that way and he's doing it on behalf of his customers. And apparently, 
None of his customers are noticed or, or, or care. I noticed and I care. I'm like, you, the case has a hard drive LED. The motherboard supports a hard drive LED. You should hook up the hard drive LED. <laughs> so I looked up, I hooked up the hard drive LED. I kind of, that's why the, the cable ties are a different color on that side. But here's what's interesting. Now, Anthony builds in different cases. But I want you to look carefully at this case. I want you to look carefully where the power light is. The, the hard drive LED is the bottom half of this light with this particular case. This is the, um, I think, the mesh of IC from Fractal Design. And any hard drive activity, you'll see that light flicker just the bottom half of the blue. It's not a different color light. And if you look at it closely, you'll see it's flickering every once in a while because Windows is still kind of doing some stuff there. And if I restart the computer, let's uh, tilt the camera up here. If I restart, I'll hit the power button, which is going to cycle the computer. You'll see that light is very subtle. It's anything but distracting, in my opinion. It, it's not bright. It just blinks a little bit. I mean, so what? I don't see what the big deal is. I know there are other cases, however, that will have really bright LEDs, but this case does not. And so having this one sort of, this is how I do it for all cases, I, I don't necessarily agree with that. However, however... <laughs> I, I want to emphasize, I don't want to be misunderstood on this. So let me just readjust my camera and let me explain. Nothing Anthony is doing is wrong. I want to be clear on this. This is Anthony's style, okay? And I got my style. Neither one of us is wrong. Anthony delivers his computers a certain way to his clientele, and I deliver my computers to my customers in a certain way, and we don't have the same customers, all right? So, that being said, I would certainly not hesitate uh, to order a computer from Anthony in the future. However, I would ask Anthony to leave things alone as far as leave the heat shields on, leave the, the shrouds on, leave the fans on, hook up all the cables. Like, I kind of feel like he's working too hard. <laughs> I, it's really a very nice complimentary negative thing to say. <laughs> it's, um, uh, the, well, I agree, there's no argument that the Noctua fans are a better quality. Customers, look, how many 200Rs have I built? And those 200Rs from Corsair, they come with two generic Corsair fans. I've not had a customer complain about the fans. They're pretty cheap. I mean, as far as fans go, they're pretty, about as cheap as you can get. I mean, they're including them at no additional charge for the case. And I asked Anthony about the uh, Be Quiet fans, and he, he does like the Be Quiet fans, but what he likes about the Noctua fans is right up here in the corner, and again, this is another one of those little details with Anthony because he's such a detail-oriented guy. The Noctua fans are not intentionally designed for better cable management, but they are by mistake. In these corners, you'll see there's a couple of holes. And with some fans, there's like a little tube that the screw will run through. But for whatever reason, Noctua has left this tube open. And as a result, Noctua has these little rubber pieces that can go in here optionally. And they've put these little holes in for the rubber piece pegs to fit in there to, to hold them in place. But these holes can be used to secure the fans as you can see, way back in the corner, Anthony has used a wire tie on one of these little mounting holes here, which you cannot do on many other case fans. You'll also see Anthony did not put the fans on with the labels facing straight. In fact, this fan is 90 degrees turned from that fan because the cable management looks better for the cables to come together and run out together. And that's beautiful, and it's very well thought out, and it's something... I don't really consider it when I build. Sometimes my OCD gets the better of me and I think it's more important that the labels all face straight up versus um, 
uh, rotating the fans so that the cabling looks better. And I have to admit, half of my brain likes that, and the other half of my brain wants to rotate it so the labels are facing up. <laughs> and the one in the back, too. You'll see the one, the fan here in the back. I think I'm running out of room to turn this. The fan on the back is tilted 90 degrees. The label should be upright. <clears throat> but again, Anthony does that. And what that does is it takes the slack out of the cable where I would bunch it up and stick it in the back. Anthony wraps the cable around the shroud of the fan frame and then uses the, uh, the mounting hole in the back to secure that wire with a zip tie so that that not only looks good, it'll never interfere with the fan or block it in any way, shape, or form. I find this to be fascinating. I am not complaining. Uh, there are items I just, I don't see my builds the way Anthony sees his, and it's very enlightening and, oh, and Anthony's in the, in the chat, which is great. Um, I, again, I, I wouldn't hesitate to order from Anthony again, and, and I'm hoping I will work with Anthony in the future, and my one request will be that he doesn't work so hard, <laughs> that he just kind of leaves some stuff alone for at least any builds he does for me. Now, for his customers, you know, he can do whatever he wants. Obviously, that's his business. That's what he does. And he's not, again, he's not doing anything wrong. He's doing it differently. And the only way I could have known was to have him build something the way he builds it and then scratch my head and go, why did you do that? And it's a little cautious because it kind of comes off as accusatory. You know, it kind of comes off as though he's done something wrong. Uh, but that's not what this is at all. This is just the independence and the creativity and the imagination of the system builder. And uh, who am I to question somebody who's successful with their own business for the last five years, you know? Clearly, he's doing something right that works for his clientele. And he would be more than happy, I am sure, if I had requested, if I had known that he was going to do this stuff, if I had said, hey, Anthony, please leave that alone, and please leave this alone, and please hook up my hard drive LED, he would have been more than happy to do that. But I didn't know to ask that. <laughs> but it's no big deal to, to correct it the way I would do it. So, um, so Mahdi, you know, knows that he's getting a system that would be the same way that, you know, at the end of the day, the hard drive LED would be hooked up, the M.2 heat shields would be on. Because that's, that's it. That's all it is. So uh, I was glad Anthony joined us there in the chat. I'm sorry I missed him. It looks like he had to run, but um, he's a super nice guy. I, I can't say enough about Anthony, and I really, <laughs> he says HDD LED is a personal preference for sure. If you've been uh, watching my channel for a while, you'll remember I reviewed a Silverstone case that was all glass and designed really to show off RGB lighting. And I was baffled that they did not include a hard drive LED or a power LED on the case. And I reached out to Silverstone and I said, this doesn't make any sense. Why would you remove RGB lights that are important? They convey information. The power light tells you when the system is on, which is pretty critical when you have a whisper quiet system and you can't tell if it's on or off. And why would you remove the hard drive LED, which conveys important information as to whether or not your drive is reading or writing? It's pretty important to know when diagnosing a system. And he says, well, you know, the design, the person who designed that was really going for a, a clean, you know, uh, he thought the, really the focus was on the RGB. And I'm like, but, but that's more RGB. Your power light and your hard drive light are the original RGB. So to remove lights that convey information, to replace them with lights that blink and flash or show pretty colors for no apparent reason, it racks my brain. <laughs> Not that Anthony did any of that. I'm just saying, if, you, if you've watched my channel, you've seen my review of that Silverstone case, I was puzzled. Like, you would think if the case was designed for RGB, you'd add lights to it, not take lights away. And again, removing lights that actually convey information that weren't getting in the way of anything. The motherboard still has the header. <laughs> it wasn't like you're freeing up any resources. Uh, it's illogical. Um, but in any event, I've got this Windows 10 activated. 
and I've got uh, Malwarebytes Professional, or not, not Professional, Premium activated on there for Mahdi. And my FedEx store is still closing early. They used to be open until 9 o'clock at night. And I used to like to go over there about 8 o'clock when the sun is down and the traffic is less, you know, and I didn't have to deal with a bunch of people. But unfortunately, I wasn't able to get this done in time. But rest assured, Mahdi, this is going out tomorrow afternoon. I'll have a tracking number for you. And then I was debating whether or not I wanted to pack it the way I normally pack it or leave it the way Anthony has packed it. Now, normally, I would put the case back in the case box. Anthony doesn't ship that way, and so I don't have the original case box. Therefore, I have decided, um, first of all, it's 25 bucks to pay for FedEx for the material and the labor to pack it. So I'll save 25 bucks by reusing uh, Anthony's box and uh, packing. But more importantly, I'm curious to see how it arrives 2,000 miles away. Anthony and, I, uh, Anthony and I are only like 300 miles apart from each other. It's a very short shipping distance. It's not likely to have any damage. So, we're, you know, there's a part of me that's, that wants to do it the way I do it. But then on the other hand, Anthony's not new to this. And Anthony ships computers 2,000 miles away, and this is how he does it. And they typically don't arrive without any damage. As such, mine typically don't arrive without damage. Anthony's had some damage. I have had some damage as well. So neither one of us, you know, has a perfect method. You can't, there's only so much you can do once you hand it off to the shipper over, you know, what they do with it once they've got it. So I think I've decided I'm going to put it back the way Anthony had it and ship it Anthony's way. And we'll see through that experience how it arrives. And, um, and Mahdi knows he'll be taken care of and everything will be insured. And I'm sure it's going to be fine because otherwise, uh, why would Anthony do it that way, right? So anyway, a great experience, wonderful experience, and I cannot thank Anthony enough. I've had some people reach out to me and ask me if I would build them a machine, and I'm so busy right now, I simply cannot take on any more work. And it wouldn't hurt my feelings to uh, have you guys ask Anthony, you know, what, what, maybe Anthony can help you out. Send a little business his way. He does wonderful, great work. And um, uh, see if, uh, you know, perhaps he can get a system to you faster than I can. My build out time right now is about five months, which is tough. It's really tough. Uh, ordering a computer and waiting five months for it seems a bit ridiculous. However, uh, that's my situation. I have bitten off more than I can chew. I have a backlog. I mentioned over a year ago that I wanted to build five computers for the Kids at Hope charity. I've only just now finished the second one of those, and I've got three more to go, and I'm going to see that through. Um, the Xenos build has been a four-year project, but again, there's no customer waiting. It's just a side project, a passion project, but that's half done, and I need to get it finished. The 3950X build that's behind behind Anthony's build. I'm pretty satisfied with that configuration. I just need to do some cable management and get it over to my sister because Threddy update. Threddy is starting to crash. And my sister was sort of, you know, love at first sight with Threddy. And I said, finally, you know, Threddy found some love. And it's been good for a few months, and now, for some reason, Threddy is starting to get slow and crash. So, of course, you know, I asked, what did you do to Threddy? And she goes, I followed all of your instructions. I, I have only installed Windows updates. I have not updated the BIOS, even though there's a newer one available, because you warned me I'm going to lose the RAID configuration. And, have to go back in the BIOS and reconfigure all that, and there's probably no benefit, and Threddy's been running really good, so I haven't changed anything other than just Windows updates and uh, I think PowerDirector updates, you know, for the editing. And now PowerDirector's crashing, and Threddy's having a real hard time. So we go back to that whole finicky nature of these real super high-end processors like Threadrippers and uh, the X series from Intel. I avoid them. It's not to say everyone will have a problem, but they do tend to be divas. They tend to be a bit more finicky because they're on that razor edge of technology, that bleeding edge of the fastest, 
and they're very, very finicky. Now, that being said, uh, my sister said she's ready to just dump Threddy. She's ready to kick him out. And she'll take 3950X here, sight unseen. She says, anything's going to be better than Threddy right now. <laughs> what, a, what a shame. What a shame. We thought Threddy found a home, and, and Threddy was doing so well. But this is, in, in my experience, typical and expected of an X399 system or of an X299 system from Intel. This is all too common. That isn't to say, once again, that everybody who has these systems will experience this. However, I have found the support to be far more, a stronger requirement in support on these systems than on socket AM4 or socket 1151 from Intel. And probably, for that matter, socket 1200 is probably going to be just as reliable as socket 1151 has been because they're not really changing much there. So if you're looking for a computer that you can just power on and use it and you're not going to be tweaking it all the time and opening it up and changing hardware and downloading every free piece of software to experiment, you, you know, if you, if you leave it alone and it's a good solid system to begin with, a good solid foundation, um, I think you'll have a, a solid trouble-free computer for many, many years. John Yasuda, a frequent visitor here in the chat, Sent, he had a, an X99 go bad, replaced it with an X299. That one went bad. I said, John, what are you using the computer for, man? And, you know, he's using it for regular stuff. I said, you don't need that. First of all, you're spending too much money. Second of all, you're buying something finicky, as you've experienced, which follows exactly what I've said. Let me build you a real high-end 1151 socket system, like a... Core i7, I don't know what it was at the time, 8700. Maybe it was a Core i9, I don't remember, but it was a, you know, a high-end consumer level chip. And John has been happy ever since, hasn't had a problem ever since. So what's interesting to me about these stories is there'll always be people coming out of the woodwork that somehow feel offended. Well, I have a socket X399, or uh, I have a, a, a Threadripper, or, and I have an X399, and it's never given me a lick of problems. Good for you. I don't support you. If you had problems, you wouldn't be calling me. You're not my customer. I don't care. <laughs> it's as though they're going to prove me wrong. It's as though they're trying to steal my experience and invalidate my reality of the number, the disproportionate number of support calls that I have to deal with with X299, X99, and X399 to the point where I don't want to build them anymore. And then giving Threadripper to my sister and having her edit videos with it, she was thrilled with it. Thrilled until now. And that's the story, right? People will say, I've never had a problem with it. Just wait. And you know what? Maybe you never will. But either way, it doesn't make a difference in my life. I can only share with you my experience. I can't share with you yours. That's for you. And I can tell you to keep my business sustainable, I cannot be offering free support on an unreliable platform. And you know, if three out of 10 Threadrippers give me problems, that's three too many. When I can build 10 out of 10 Intel or AMD based uh, socket AM4 or 1151 systems, sell it to the customer and you don't hear from the customer for years, guess where I'm steering my business. Support is a cost. Anthony has to make up for that support cost, as I mentioned. Because of the overclocking, there's a higher risk and a higher need for support. That just comes with overclocking. And to endure that added expense, Anthony has to raise prices in order to keep his head above water. Whereas I would say, I don't want to do that. I'd rather just not do it. You can do it. And you can deal with the problems it causes. So uh, different, different attitudes, but also different um, opportunities, right? Because Anthony's going to get business, I'm going to turn away. And that's typically good money. Whereas my systems, you know, average cost. I think Anthony's systems are more top shelf. You know, they're up there. Very high quality systems and, uh, and are pushed to the absolute limit with the amount of testing that Anthony puts in is ridiculous. 
Like I, I do some real basic tests you've seen before I ship. Anthony does hours and hours and hours of testing each system individually, far more than I do. But then again, he has to. When they're overclocked, he's got to ensure the stability of the system. And it just takes time and patience. And time is money. So anyway, uh, food for thought. Mati's contributed 20 bucks. He says, I thought she's going to do the cable management on Thready. Well, I told my sister, because I, I never finished Thready. I, I, th when I took the panels off to build the computer, I never put the panels back on because I was having a lot of noise issues with the cooler. I went through three or four different coolers, and then I was still having reliability issues with Thready, which through some BIOS updates and AMD chipset driver updates seemed to have resolved, and then said to my sister at that point, looks like Thready's calmed down. You want to try Thready, and if you like it, then you can do the cable management and put the panels back on it because I'm, you know, I want to get rid of it. It's a nightmare for me. It's like a, it's like a bad penny keeps coming back. <laughs> Ever heard that expression? And again, initially thrilled and thrilled for a number of months. I think it's been four or five months. I would have asked her six weeks ago, how do you feel about uh, Thready? Thready's fantastic. Ask her today. I'm ready to kick Thready to the curb. That will not happen, I am predicting, with that 3950 behind me. I was going to get her to the 3950 a little earlier, but I told Sabrent I would test one of their uh, Generation 4 solid state drives, and that's the only X570 motherboard I have and the only board I can test Generation 4 drives on. That test is done. The Sabrent drive is beautiful. Love it. In fact, I've left it in there. So there's two. Generation 4 NVMe drives, a 2 terabyte Crucial MP600 and the 1 terabyte Sabrent drive. So it's got 3 terabytes of total storage. So I need to do some cable management and put the panels on that's good to go. I will say I completely hate the Be Quiet case I built um, the 3950 in, which is hidden back over here. This case is my biggest regret on this system. These uh, drive bays that stick out, I hate them. They get in the way. You notice I, I had a, on the video card, I had a, an adapter that NVIDIA included for free with the graphics card. It's usually a $15 add-on item that lets you move the cables to the side for, better, for a better look. But when I move the cables to the side, these drive bays won't go in. And you might say, well, just leave the drive bays out, Kerry. You don't need them. Well, the case came with them. And if I take them out, where am I going to put them? And how am I going to find them if I ever want to put them back? And it leaves this weird gap right here, which is really strange. And, um, and it's got this fan controller on it, like a case from 1997. And I don't understand why it's got a fan controller. And I can go on and on and on and on. It's heavy. It's very heavy. So there's a part of me that wants to pull all the parts out of this Be Quiet case and put them in literally anything else. Now, I don't feel that way about all Be Quiet cases, but this one, oh, it angers me. It angers me. And look, the folks over at Be Quiet were kind enough to send the case to me for review. And I got to tell you, Be Quiet's not having a good track record with me between I don't like the power supply, the way that they've got the cables vertically oriented, making it very difficult to see where the cables are going when you have a shroud covering the power supply. I don't like this case design. I don't like the fact that it... Uh, um, again, the fan controller seems outdated to me. These, these got to go. This is a bad, bad design. I don't like require special screws to put the hard drives in. So I'm on the fence about pulling everything out of that and putting it into a different case. So Ryan, a viewer uh, named Ryan, had seen that I had a Leon Lee case in my wish list for Amazon that if you know somebody wanted to buy this Leon Lee case, I'll review it, but I'm not going to buy it because I really don't need it. Well, Ryan bought the case and sent it to me and said, uh, you got a case coming. It's the case on your list, the one you asked for, and I'll look forward to the review. <laughs> so I owe Ryan that review on that case. And it's the, um, what is it, the Leon Lee um, Land cool. It's got some lighting on the sides, but it's not overly RGB'd. And it looks pretty big, 
and it's kind of heavy, and I need to review it, and I'm thinking maybe maybe pulling the parts out of uh, the Be Quiet case and moving them into the Leon Lee, see if the liquid cooling will fit better or whatever. Uh, because the, this case has a liquid, uh, this motherboard configuration has a liquid cooler on it, I want to keep the configuration. I just want it in a different case. <clears throat> but that will delay my sister getting it and putting it to use. So, you know, eeny, meeny, miny, mo. Got a decision to make on that. Getting to the point of today's video. Last week, I, re I released a quick tip on the apps that I remove from Windows 10 as part of the process of prepping a computer to go out to a customer. And I mentioned that there were some I would remove, but the uninstall button is grayed out, and it won't let, re let me remove them. Uh, some people had commented on that video stating that a lot of those things you remove end up coming back the next time there's a big Windows 10 update. Once a year, basically, Windows 10 is released in a new version. Consider it like Service Pack 1, Service Pack 2, but they don't call it that anymore. Now it's called the, uh, the May 2020 update, or you know, in this case, uh, the, the, the 2004 update or whatever. In fact, rumor was that an update was supposed to come out this weekend, but it didn't. What a surprise. Those rumors have never been right. I don't know why I continue to convey them to you guys because they've never once been accurate. But any day now, Microsoft's going to release the new version of Windows 10. And it's a complete reinstall of Windows 10 every time they do this. And that means a lot of stuff you've taken off gets put back on. It also means that Windows 10 doesn't require the annual refreshing like Windows XP did, dealing with the bloated registry and what we used to call Windows rot. It just doesn't happen anymore because essentially you're reinstalling Windows 10 once a year whether you like it or not. So it's pretty rare anybody really needs to reinstall Windows 10. It still happens once in a while, but it's pretty rare. Some people do it because they don't know any better. They just think that's my computer's feeling sluggish, and rather than actually learn why and fix it, I'll just do what I've always done for the reasons that no longer exist. I, I, not much I can say to those people. But several people in the comment section said, why don't you use the Windows 10 debloater from GitHub? Now, I never heard of the Windows 10 debloater from GitHub. I've heard of Windows 10 debloaters and decrapifier and all sorts of system utilities from manufacturers. Uh, CCleaner has an uninstall. Of course, there's uh, the famous one is um, Revo, Revo uninstaller. And I, I don't like the idea of installing a program to uninstall programs. It really bothers me that people think that way. It's very strange to me. So GitHub is this community of developers all working together. It's all open source. It's all free, all helping each other out for the sake of making the best software possible completely open, completely transparent, and, and completely available for improvement upon others to take it and manipulate it and submit it to the community and refine it, with the idea being that it's just not one person's vision. It's, it's a number of people volunteering their time to make the best product possible. And GitHub has a lot of different projects going on, and they're all free. They're all open source, and they, of course, don't really have any warranty or any sort of um, liability, really. It's sort of at your own risk. And typically, I don't like to remove anything that Microsoft doesn't want you to remove because there could be long-term consequences that you won't realize for a while. On the other hand, because Windows 10 is basically reinstalled, whether you like it or not, once a year, I really don't know that that risk still exists anymore today. And for that reason, we're going to demonstrate the Windows 10 debloater here on Mahdi System. Uh, I, uh, uh, Mari, relax. I've already tested it on my own system a few days ago, and it's perfect. It works great. There's no, I haven't found any negative consequences to running it. And it actually works better than I thought it would. Now, it is a community project. It is not a highly polished commercial project or product like you would be accustomed to um, with most software that you would see online. This is a community project, so it's a little rough around the edges in how it looks, 
but the way it works, it's very well tested. The community tests it very thoroughly. And everybody's doing it because they want to, not because they're getting paid or not because it's a job. There's a passion behind it, which, in my opinion, makes for an overall better project. So I want to thank all the commenters. Many of you recommended the Windows 10 Debloater and bringing that to my attention because I might start adding it to my repertoire. I realize some of the applications people want. So, you know, for my business clients, I can tell you right now, the Windows 10 Debloater will be fine. They, they want it removed. You know, everything that Windows 10 Debloater removes, my business clients would want removed. Maybe OneDrive, some business clients may want, but even then, I don't think so. So I've got Mati's system right here. This is the computer from Remus Computer Solutions. I've got Windows 10 activated and Malwarebytes activated on there. And I've got it all set and ready to ship, except this one final step of debloating Windows 10. Now, I went through it the way I go through it, which is manually going through the apps list, just like I showed in the Quick Tips video. This is going to take out more, and it doesn't require me clicking on a bunch of stuff. It automates it, and it gives me some control. It doesn't just blindly take a bunch of stuff off on my behalf. It's asking me at certain sections, do you want this type of product removed? Do you want that type? Let me show you. So I don't know the website off the top of my head. It is listed in the video notes below the video. But let's go over to the desktop right now. Let me switch over to what is camera two. And let me put myself in the corner so you'll still see me. And it looks like the computer's gone to sleep. Let me wake it up. Wakey, wakey. There it is. There's Mahdi's computer looking good. Running silent. Now, as I mentioned, I don't know the name of the website, and I could go to the notes on this video, but I'm not going to because I want to show you how to be self-reliant. When you see me using a piece of software, whether it's Prime95 or Crystal Disk Info, Crystal Disk Mark, HW Info, HW Monitor, CPU-Z, you can download all those for free. You don't have to ask me where they are. I think Google is a critical search engine to use. And it's not to say you can't find the product with Bing or Yahoo or, I don't know, DuckDuckGo. It's that typically Google will give me the, the top response that I intend to find, where those other sites, you might have to dig down a few links. That's the only reason why I recommend Google. It's really a recommendation for the novices out there not for the experts, okay? If you consider yourself an expert and, and you like using AltaVista for your, I mean, you go right ahead, use whatever search engine you want. But for the rest of us, the regular computer users who don't really quite understand all this stuff and you're looking for, you know, a little more self-reliance, this is how you search. We go to Google and we're very specific on what we're going to ask Google for. And Google will reliably return the exact result we want right at the top. Let me demonstrate. I don't exactly know the name of this product. I know it's a Windows 10 debloater and I know it's from GitHub. And so that's all I know and that's what I'm going to type right here in Google. I'm going to type Windows 10. I'm even going to just put bloat and then I'm going to put GitHub. See, I don't even have to be that specific. Watch the very first link that pops up now, you can see I've been here before because the link is pink, but it's the very first link. Very first link right here. I don't have to look any further down. This is taking us to github.com. So I'm going to click on that. And <clears throat> there are a number of files here. And for the technical folks, you can read through that. I'm intending this for non-technical people. So you just have to do what I'm doing. Right up here, it says clone or download. We're going to hit that button, and we're going to download the zip file. And that's going to be saved. We're going to hit save, and that's going to go in our downloads folder. By default, if you haven't messed around with your Windows, it's defaulting into the Windows folder. Now we can hit the open dialog here, and we can close the browser. We're done with that. We've got the file. We don't need the browser open anymore. So here's the Windows 10 Debloater Master. They call it Master. I don't know why. It's a programmer thing. Hit Extract All, 
and just extract. It's going to extract that into a folder with the same name as the zip file. Think of a zip file as a box that arrives in the mail. And inside that box are numerous items. It's all packaged in, in one, it's all in one package. You might buy, I don't know, some dishes. You don't buy each dish in its own box. There may be a set of dishes in one box. A zip file is a box. When you open the zip file, that's the contents of the box. That way you don't have to download each individual file separately. You download the package and then you open the package, which we refer to as unzipping. We've unzipped into this directory. And if I double click on this, we have several scripts here, PS1. These are PowerShell scripts. To run the PowerShell script, I believe, I, I, it's been a while since I've done this, we want the graphical user interface called a GUI. That's really the only file we need here. And I should be able to right click on it and run with PowerShell. I think that's all I have to do. And then click open. And then I'm gonna close these windows back here because I don't need it. And you'll see kind of an old school uh, window appearing here. And we have to give it a minute. It's um, doing something, I think. Is my hard drive light blinking? Is doing something. I, I may have skipped a step. I may have to run PowerShell in administrator mode. Um, or there's another hidden window I'm not seeing. Ah, there is a hidden window right here. This is the one I want. This is what makes it super easy for anybody to use. You don't have to be a technical expert, but you'll see it's not exactly pretty. Right? This isn't the most polished thing you've ever seen. So we've got the ability to customize what we want it to remove, called a blacklist. A blacklist is typically things you don't want, and a whitelist is typically things you do want. All right, that's the naming convention. Don't get political on me, it's ridiculous. We can simply hit remove all bloatware. This is a very safe option, or remove the bloatware with your customized blacklist, meaning you want it add a few more things that you personally want removed that most people don't. But this is going to remove pretty much an agreement with the community agrees is unnecessary. Beyond that, we can disable Cortana or re-enable Cortana if we had disabled it. Microsoft Edge likes to come up as your PDF reader by default. And again, you can disable or enable that. We can uninstall OneDrive separately, which is great. As I mentioned, I have some business clients that use it. Some business clients hate the fact that OneDrive keeps popping up asking them to log in every time they start the computer ever since they installed Office 365 and it drives them crazy. And you can just go to your start startup and just uncheck the box to stop that or you can go another step further and remove OneDrive altogether. Then there's the telemetry, the stuff of Windows 10 supposedly spying on you stuff, right? You could disable that as well. You can unpin tiles from the start menu, which I'm a big fan of. I hate the tiles. You'll see when you click on the start menu down here, I've removed those tiles. So I have a skinny start menu. My start menu doesn't extend all the way out here. That's just something that I prefer. Then of course, some people like to enable dark mode. This is an individual choice. I won't make this decision for my customer. And of course you can disable, you can reverse your decisions. It's not that everything you're doing is necessarily one way. I will say that any bloatware you remove, you cannot just simply hit a button to bring it back, but you probably can re-download it again or, or click on your uh, Windows Features option in your control panel and add those items back manually. So again, still reversible, just not through the app. And then of course, installing the .NET 3.5 framework, which is optional. The only thing I would do for my customers is I would hit remove all bloatware right here. And you'll see what's happening behind this window. If I can move the window, is it going to move? It's not letting me move. Oh, here we go. And you'll see it's running commands in PowerShell that you could run by hand, but it's automating it so that you don't have to run it by hand. So if you want to follow along and read what it's doing, you know, and the commands that were given. It says it has finished all tasks. So that's your indication that it's done. You don't really get much more of an indication than that. 
Um, with regards to Cortana, I would leave it alone. The PDF reader, I would leave alone. Uninstalling OneDrive, I leave alone. Uh, disabling the telemetry, it certainly couldn't hurt if you want to disable the telemetry. And again, it's already done. You'll see the very last thing down here says telemetry has been disabled. And telemetry is just a clever word for monitoring your computer usage. Primarily, Microsoft wants to monitor when your system crashes and what was in memory at the time so they can identify if a bunch of people are having a crash that all have this particular driver version. Microsoft can address that. They don't necessarily know who you are or specifically where you are, but they're getting, you can imagine, tens of millions of these reports. So it's all an AI that reads through them all to find a common denominator. Most of it's just thrown in the trash and useless in that case. There are some bloatware reg keys, registry keys. We can certainly hit that and remove that. And that should prevent some of these applications from coming back on a reinstall. And there it says additional bloatware key. You have to read the screen. You don't, it's unfortunate that they haven't sort of brought up a pop-up window that says, hey, we're good to go. You sort of have to pay attention and, and at least read the last line on the screen. So you need to have these two screens visible, right? This one to perform the action and this screen to watch the action being performed. Uh, this is really a nerdy engineering kind of way of resolving a problem. It's basically removing everything manually, but, but doing it for you on your behalf automatically. It's sort of like having a manual transmission that shifts automatically. That is a thing, by the way. An automatic manual transmission sounds like a contradiction, but it's a real thing. Now, there's no negative consequence that I have found yet from running this, and so therefore, I am recommending it. You'll see I just closed the first window, and it closed the second window automatically. And now I'm going to restart the computer to make sure that we still start OK. Look, my start button's not working. This is nothing to worry about. I've actually seen this on um, after uninstalling some applications. And after installing some Windows updates, I've seen where the Start menu temporarily doesn't work. And if this happens to you, don't freak out. Nothing is necessarily broken. If I hit the power switch on top of the computer, that should cycle it just as though I hit the power, uh, just as though I use the, the mouse. It's the same process. It shuts down all your applications, and it's a safe shutdown. Now, when I turn the system back on, I bet the Start menu is going to be just fine. It was just that one-time consequence, which probably has to do with one of the registry settings needing a restart to take effect, right? So if anything, they should add an automatic restart, I think, to this Windows 10 to bloater so that it avoids people freaking out like, oh, you just broke my computer. I knew you shouldn't have played with that utility because a lot of these utilities do break your computer, as I mentioned. But I'll bet you, I'll bet you the start menu works fine. Let's see. Oh, it, it works. But look. We're back to having these pinned here, which is very strange because didn't I tell it to unpin all the tiles? So why did that happen? I don't know. I want to go back to the downloads folder, and I want to go back to that directory, and I'm going to run this again. Right-click on the GUI file, run with PowerShell, and I want to click the button that says unpin tiles from the start menu. And it says it's unpinning all the tiles. I think I could have done this by hand faster. <laughs> I don't know why it's taking so long. But it has taken a while. And they're still there. That's weird. I may need to run this with administrator privileges. It, it may be what's happening here. I, I haven't been able to read the chat room. Late. You guys might be yelling at me that I'm not running it with administrator privileges.
Yeah, that's clearly taking far too long. Now, I can sit here and I can try and figure this out, but quite frankly, it's not that important to me. Um, and this is one of the issues you can potentially run into using utilities to try to improve your computer and end up, you know, waiting 10 minutes for something you could do by hand in 10 seconds. So I'm going to just close this out. I don't know why it's taking so long. It's not even letting me close it. Everything is sort of stuck. And it may be because I didn't run it with administrator privileges. It's very strange. This is a very fast computer and so things shouldn't be taking this long. Now, <clears throat> what I'm going to do to sort of break this uh, process is hit Control alt delete and that should universally bring up the task manager and then I'm going to manually end the task and we'll shut down Windows PowerShell. With Windows PowerShell shut down, I uh, can go back to the Start menu and just simply right-click on these tiles and choose Unpin from Start. Right-click on each tile, one by one, and unpin from Start. That's all I had to do. And you can see I did that a lot faster than whatever this delay was. You'll also see when I go to the... Oh, and one more time, when I look at the Start menu now, it's skinny again. But if you uh, bring up the... Windows folder, you'll see there's this recent files that shows sort of the history of the files you're working on. Some people like that and some people not so much. If you don't want your history, you can right click and go to personalize and then you go to, um, where is it? Does it start? Show recently added apps. Show apps in the start menu, show suggestions, show recently opened items in the jump lists and in the quick access. You can turn that off right there. And now my history isn't there. So, you know, if you're opening up files that you don't want people to know you've been opening and you're not aware that when somebody else uses that computer, they're, they're going to see that history, that's how easy it is to turn that off. Now, on the other hand, if you're somebody who doesn't really know where your files are and you were working on a file, those recent lists are quite helpful to the majority of computer owners who don't really understand folder and file structure. They just know they were working on this Word document. They don't know where it is. And so by going to the recent folders, they can change that. I know people that will make that adjustment in Microsoft Word where they'll say, don't show me my last three documents by default. Show me my last ten. People like me, nerds, we know exactly where our files are. We don't need that recent list. We know exactly which subfolder we put our files in. We don't lose files. We're nerds and we understand file and folder structure. But most people are not nerds and most people honestly don't give a rat's behind about file and folder structure. They just want to continue working on the last file that they were working on. They don't know where it is. So that's what these customizations are all about, right? Customizing it to your specific needs. And by debloating it now, it's got a little more resources, perhaps a little more performance. We haven't heard anything with regards to reliability, I assure you. I have tested this left, right, and center, and, you know, the, the whole start menu thing, that happens. That, that's even happened to me when I've manually uninstalled some apps, or even sometimes after I've installed some Windows updates. I have seen the situation where the start menu temporarily doesn't respond. Never forget that you have a power button and simply tapping that power button will cycle the power properly. If you hold the power button down for up to 10 seconds, it's just like unplugging power from the PC. That's not good on the PC. But if that's the only way you can shut it down, then so be it. But ideally, if your start button's not working, you need to restart. And how can you restart if your start button's not working? That's how. That works the same with uh, with laptops as well, although many laptops will default to just go to sleep, which is really frustrating. If you're hitting the button on your laptop and it's going to sleep instead of cycling off, you can change that in your power options and your control panel, or you can hold the power button in for up to 10 seconds and force the whole laptop off. Again, this is not ideal. However, um, it'll get the job done typically without consequences. Typically. But it's to be avoided unless absolutely necessary. But, but it's another tool to have in your arsenal to maintain and have control of your computer 
and uh, and be able to feel confident. You know, the things are gonna they are gonna go sideways sometimes. It's important that you're not messing around with experimental software or software from a foreign source. You, you know, that can infect your computer with viruses, it can infect you with ransomware, it can encrypt all your files, it can be very, very nasty. So even with fully tested software, just like I showed you with a community of volunteers that are coding this together and testing this together, you can still see that there's still a little bit of imperfection. But we didn't cause any damage, and that's the important thing. And some of these applications that are out there that tune your system ultimately end up causing damage to the system. You're fixing something that's not necessarily broken. Would Mahdi know if I didn't take those apps off? Would he feel a difference in performance? Would he see the extra space freed up on the hard drive? No, he wouldn't. He wouldn't. On the other hand, he's also not going to miss anything I've removed, and he's not going to have any negative consequences because that's a trusted known piece of software that the community has. You know, it, it's transparent, it's open source, you can see everything it's doing, and uh, it's, it's all good. Worst case scenario, you have to reinstall Windows 10 and put it back the way it was and leave it alone. Okay? As long as you leave it alone, you're less likely to suffer any consequences down the road. Again, if it's a good quality piece of software, that shouldn't be an issue anyway. I don't recommend you just download every free piece of software available. It may come with a price that's much higher than you were ever expecting to pay. So for the most part, I'm going to say leave it alone. But the reason I made this video is the bloatware removal tool that's available for free on GitHub does in fact remove things that Microsoft doesn't let you remove through the apps application in the control panel. And if you're a stickler, as many of you are, about wanting to get that bloatware out of your system because you find it offensive, this is a tool you can use. If you're an average home user, you probably won't know the difference one way or the other. And this video really isn't for you. If you want to experiment with it, it is a safe piece of software to experiment with. But do understand, anytime you're making changes that are you know, areas where Microsoft doesn't intend you to remove uh, or make changes, such as in the registry, and it does come with a bit of a risk. In this case, I believe the risk to be minimal, and I believe the risk to be worth it to get that crap out. But that's me, okay? That's not you. I will say I'll probably be removing the bloatware removal. I, I will be using the Windows 10 bloatware removal tool for my business customers from this point forward. Now that I know it exists, thank you to everybody who made me aware of it. I had no idea. And I would much prefer that to Revo Uninstaller or CCleaner or any of the other corporative, uh, corporation owned tools that need to be installed <laughs> to uninstall, which is preposterous. The Windows PowerShell is sort of like the new DOS prompt, if you will. And it's really for the geeks and the nerds to get in hardcore with the keyboard and start doing things the old fashioned way. And it's quick and dirty, and it gets right to the point. It's not worried about looking pretty or making pretty sounds. It's there to get a job done and to do it efficiently. I do believe it needs to be run in administrative mode. I think that's why the tiles didn't get removed and why it sort of froze up. It's a shame that the developers don't force that. Uh, it's getting there. You know, it's an open source, transparent project that's constantly under improvement. and. You know, unlike other tools from corporations with budgets, people are doing this voluntarily in their free time. So as Microsoft releases updates that makes changes or releases updated versions of Windows with a full install, that they respond to that relatively quickly with an updated version. So when you're, if you're going to use the uh, Windows 10 bloatware removal tool, make sure you're downloading the latest version. If you downloaded a version from six months ago and you use it today, it may cause problems. And this is important of all system utilities. It's no longer important for you to download and store your own utilities. The internet is your library and the internet will store your files for you. In this way, you can ensure that you're downloading the latest version at all times. As I mentioned, there is a risk with system utilities that you can damage, you can damage your machine if the system utility isn't kept up to date. So with that, I hope you guys found this video useful. It is free. Always make sure you have a backup at all times. Some people ask me, 
I'm about to do something to my computer. I don't know, whatever it is. Should I back it up first? That's the dumbest question I've ever heard. I, I like to say there's no dumb questions, but that's a really dumb question because you should always have a system backup at all times. It's like saying, I'm going to go on a long road trip. You think I should put car insurance on my car? You're not more likely to get into an accident because it's a long road trip. You're just as likely to get into an accident driving around the block. In fact, that's where most accidents happen. In the same way, most people don't require a backup because they change something on their system. Most people require their backup because something unexpected happened. That's what your backup is for. If you're expecting to need it, you probably don't need it. You have to expect the unexpected. And the way you do that is you back up your files on a regular basis so that when you're surprised, you're prepared. Not a big secret. Data recovery should not even be a business. It's real simple. If you have to ask, should I back up my system, you don't have to finish your sentence. The answer is always yes, and you should be doing it on a regular basis. Nobody cares more about your data than you do. It's your own loss, not mine. It affects nobody but you or your business. So how often should you back up your data? Well, that's a question you need to ask yourself. If I woke up this morning and my computer didn't turn on, or my house caught fire, or a drunk driver drove through my house and hit my computer room and smashed my computer, or I was woke up and found out I was robbed, or my, uh, my house was flooded, or I hit with, was hit with ransomware, or my hard drive died, or my RAM corrupted all my files, or I got some ransomware, you don't know. So ask yourself, if I wake up tomorrow and my computer doesn't work or is missing, is my backup got everything on it that I'm going to be okay? And if the answer is no, then it's time for you to update your backup. This is going to be a different answer for everybody. Nobody can tell you how often you should back up your data. It's a question you have to ask yourself. Backing up takes time, but I really don't have time for it. Okay, well then you're okay with potentially losing all that data? Well, I don't see any reason why I would lose the data. Nobody ever, nobody who ever sent their hard drive in for data recovery <laughs> thought, you know, next Tuesday, I want to plan for my hard drive to fail. And rather than back it up, I'll just plan on sending it into data recovery. Never heard anybody plan for sending a drive in for data recovery before it fails. And if you have a backup, you would never need to send that drive in for data recovery, and it would save you time and money. So, something to think about. That's going to wrap it up for me tonight. Thanks, you guys, for watching so much. Thanks again to Anthony Remus. Be sure and check out Anthony's website and his builds if you're looking for an overclock build, or for that matter, if you're looking for any build. <laughs> I am swamped. I, have, I simply cannot take on any more work at this time. I can't speak for Anthony. Reach out to him. I'm sure he'd be happy to give you a quote. He does excellent work, and I highly recommend him. And uh, I did have a system build coming up with Steve Bass on Friday. However, I think I'm going to have to postpone that. Um, I have a family situation that um, uh, my father is in failing health, and I believe I'm going to need to take a trip out to say goodbye. Uh, so th there will be an interruption in the videos for a few days uh, due to this circumstance. And I will rearrange what I was planning for another day. Thanks, you guys, so much again for watching. I really appreciate all the contributions. I know I missed some today. So real quickly, let me go back through and give a shout out to uh, those folks that I have unintentionally ignored who've been so generous to contribute during today's live stream. Eric P. contributed $1.00. Scott Brooks with a $10 contribution and a $20 contribution. Thank you, Scott. That's very kind of you. Jeremy Kramer contributed $5. He says, great builds you've done lately, Kerry. If the Mugen 5 were to be discontinued, what would you suggest as the next best cooler? I don't know the answer to that yet, but I've got a video coming up comparing a Hyper 212 Evo to a pure... pure Be Quiet sent me the pure... 
can never think of their product names. I've got it back here. Um, they actually sent it to me before it was released, and they didn't want me to talk about it until the release date. But it was released a couple weeks ago. Pure Rock 2. That's what it's called, Pure Rock 2. Um, so the Hyper 212 Evo versus the Be Quiet Pure Rock 2, brand new product from the folks over at Be Quiet. And then, of course, uh, the Mugen 5. And we'll see the price difference, the noise difference, the cooling difference, and the installation process difference between these three coolers to determine value, performance, and ease of installation. Um, you can see I'm a bit leery now with working with Be Quiet. They, they seem to be on a different page than me. It's not that they make bad products. They're just not products that I necessarily get on board with the design. And they don't meet my preference. It doesn't mean they're bad. It just doesn't meet my preference. So I'm kind of going at this a bit negative. Maybe this will surprise me. Maybe they'll win me over. My thanks uh, over to email at Be Quiet for, you know, <laughs> continuing to take my abuse. <laughs> um, they appreciate the criticism and the, the, it's not really criticism, it's it's feedback with the intent to make a better product or what I believe would be a better product, which again, most companies would give me the middle finger. Uh, be Quiet has heard me and responded and uh, in some cases they just agree to disagree. They don't think they're doing anything wrong. I think they are with some things, with some things. That being said, uh, they did send me the Pure Rock 2, which is a 150 watt uh, TDP. The Mugen 5 is the single best number one cooler that Scythe makes. So the fear that Scythe would, would discontinue it is illogical. If you have a product you cannot keep on the shelf, why would you discontinue it? I can assure you the Mugen 5 is going to be around a very long time. Unfortunately, there are some distribution issues where it continually goes in and out of stock at Amazon. And it's a very strange thing. You can go three, four days in a row and Amazon will say that uh, the product's out of stock and we don't know if we'll be getting any more in and there'll be some jerk face offering to sell you one for three times the price. Don't pay those jerk faces. Just be patient. Usually within a week, it's back up at $48.99 on Amazon. It's no big deal. And I'm partly curious if people actually want to buy them or, or if they only want it because it's not available. Like, are you just checking every day? It seems weird to me, the number of people that email me and reach out to me to tell me when it's out of stock on Amazon. I mean, are we selling, am I responsible for selling that, really, that many Mugen 5s? Or is it that you guys are just upset that it's not available for sale even though you weren't ready to pull the trigger to buy one? I don't know the situation here, but it's very strange. Because if, if I'm responsible for selling that much product that on any given day I get four or five emails every single time Amazon temporarily runs out of stock, well, I should be making a commission because I'm missing out on a big chunk of change. <laughs> I don't think that's what's happening. I think you guys are watching the page I think you guys see it's not available, and then you're writing to me and complaining about it. I don't think you were ready to buy it. I think you're, you're thinking about buying it. I think you're considering buying it. And then when it's out of stock and there's no longer an option for you to buy it, you get upset about it. Because I've had no problem buying them. I've been buying them for, what, a year and a half? Sometimes I just have to wait a week until they're back in stock. The last batch I ordered five or six, I had to wait three or four weeks after I ordered them for them to come in because of the pandemic. So I'm sitting on four or five or six of them here. I have no shortage of Mugen 5s. When you go to Scythe's website, it's a big banner across the top of the website advertising the Mugen 5. It's the single best-selling cooler they make. Why would it be discontinued? So to answer your question, what would I use if the Mugen 5 was discontinued? My question to you is, why would the Mugen 5 be discontinued? In the meantime, I might be surprised by the uh, Pure Rock 2, and I was going to order a new Cooler Master Hyper 212 Evo because I thought the design had changed, but looking at Amazon, they just offer a black version, but otherwise it looks like the same cooler. And I remember reading an article that they were offering an upgraded version that had two custom fans on each side. It was big and it was bulky, but it appears, I don't know what that is, but I'm not seeing it available for sale. 
So I have a couple of Cooler Master Hyper 212 Evils brand new in a box. I guess that's going to be a fair test. Even though they've been in a box for about a year, I think they're still selling the same cooler. Feel free to correct me if I'm wrong. And so I'll have the same system set up. I don't know what system yet, but I'll have a, an i7 or an i9, something that'll run hot. And we'll go through the process of installing. We'll, we'll run Prime 95. We'll look at the cooling ability. We'll listen to the noise it makes. And we'll see how much it sells for. And then you can decide for yourself which one meets your needs. I'm not picking a winner. I just, I already know I like the Mugen 5. I'm going to tell you right now. I'm going to tell you before I run the test. I like the Mugen 5. I like how it installs. I like how quiet it is. I like its price. I am open-minded enough to give the Be Quiet um, Pure Rock 2 a chance. And if it impresses me, I'll be the most surprised. But I got to give it its fair shake, right? Cooler Master Hyper, 12, Hyper 212, I... I already know what that's going to do. I already know that installation process. I know it like the back of my hand. I know how it performs. I know it's audible level. I know what it sells for. It's cheap. It's difficult to install. It's a really good value, but it's a real pain to install. Mugen 5, better value, super easy to install. Well, I don't know that's a better value. It's a better value because it's super easy to install, not necessarily because, surprisingly, it doesn't seem to cool any better than the Hyper 212, but I still need to retest that. And I don't know what's in that box. I'm basing my anticipation and expectation on the past. But maybe Be Quiet's doing something they've never done before. I won't know until I open the box. I hope you'll join me for that. That'll come up at some point next week. I Again, thank you all for joining me. Thanks for participating in the chat. Thank you to all my friends in blue for helping to keep it civil in there today. And thanks for all the contributions I appreciate, uh, uh, again, all the contributions. I think I missed a couple here. Did I not finish the list? I didn't finish. The, see, I got interrupted. Uh, this is what happens when you get old. You're very easily distracted onto a whole other thought. Richard Angeline contributed $2. Glenn Davies contributed two Australian dollars. He says, disable the hard drive LED for people that defrag zebras. <laughs> Matty UL contributed $20. Ian Costello contributed 10 pounds. Hey, Ian, thank you so much for that. And uh, John Jack Wilson contributed 20 bucks. He goes, here's a little something for the projects that are ongoing. Uh, John, thank you so much. I really appreciate your uh, support and your friendship. You're a super human being, and I, I, you are very appreciated, as are all of you, of course. And um, that's going to wrap it up for me tonight. I'll see you all again. Uh, very, very soon. Until then, bye for now.